So my aim today is to convince you that venomous animals, rather than being vilified, which we have a tendency to do, should actually be celebrated as a source of life-saving human therapeutics. Now those of us that live in Australia will be well aware that we are literally surrounded by venomous animals, right? But in fact, venomous animals are replete throughout the entire world. Because about 15% of all animal species on the planet are actually venomous. Things like venomous spiders, bees, ants and wasps are common in suburban backyards right around the world and they're all completely venomous. Some are more exotic, like assassin bugs, which interestingly we find to be very prevalent in the local cemetery, rather ironically, a bit more uncommon. But we find these animals all the way around the world. And of those of us that live in Queensland know, there's no escaping these venomous animals when we venture into the ocean. Of course, there's plenty of venomous marine animals as well, right? Octopus, sea anemones, uh, jellyfish, stingrays, venomous snails that we'll talk about later. And for the first fun fact of the day, did you know that many corals are actually venomous? Corals are actually closely related to sea anemones and jellyfish and they use the exact same type of stinging cells known as nematocytes to deliver their venom and capture prey. So why do we have so many venomous animals in the, on the planet? And the reason is the possession of venoms transforms the act of capturing your prey from a physical battle to chemical warfare. And what that enables you to do is capture prey that's much bigger than you, that's potentially dangerous, or is just more mobile than you. So this little crab spider here is killing a bee that is not only much larger than the spider, but has the potential to fly away. So why can it do that? Because it has venom that will rapidly immobilise that bee, so it can't escape. Perhaps the most bizarre use of venom, though, are these marine cone snails. These are slow-moving snails that live at the bottom of the ocean, and remarkably, many of them prey on fish. So how do these slow-moving cone snails capture fish? This sounds like something out of science fiction, but what they do is they take venom and they load it into minuscule harpoons and they actually shoot it at the fish. And that instantaneously paralyzes the fish and they just reel it in and eat it. It's quite remarkable. Now, some venomous animals are dangerous to us, and snakes are the prime example, but no venomous animal has evolved to kill us. And what that means is the vast majority of venomous animals aren't actually harmful to humans. And a classic example is the world's biggest spider, the Goliath tarantula. This hasn't been photoshopped, this is the real size. These spiders can get as large as a dinner plate. And yet, like all tarantulas, they're completely harmless to humans. They pose no threat to us at all. And the other thing we have to remember is that all of these venomous animals play really important roles in their own ecosystems. Which brings me to the second fun fact of the day, and that is that spiders make up 25 million tonnes of the Earth's biomass, and each year they eat more tonnes of insect prey than the entire human population eats in meat and fish every year. That's a lot of insects. We'd probably be suffering from an insect apocalypse if it wasn't for these spiders eating these insects every single day. So what is in these venoms? What compounds do we find in there? When I started looking at this 20 years ago, I had no idea. And naively I thought, well, these secretions are probably not very complicated. Why does a spider need more than a few insecticidal compounds to kill its prey? But how wrong I was. What I'm going to show you is the very first experiment from 20 years ago that I ran to try and explore what was in the venom of the infamous Australian funnelweb spider. And this is a process that separates the venom components according to whether they're very water-soluble or not so water-soluble, and the water-soluble compounds come out first. And I was expecting a couple of peaks, and this is what I found. The peaks just kept coming and coming and coming and coming. There weren't a few compounds. There weren't a few dozen compounds. There were, in fact, hundreds of compounds, at least, in the venom of this spider. And the amazing thing was, the ones that came out first that were very water-soluble were small molecules, things like amino acids, neurotransmitters, but all the rest were small proteins or peptides about the size of human insulin. And what we now know, quite remarkably, is the venom of the Australian funnel web spider contains more than 3,000 different peptides. We think it may be the most complicated chemical arsenal in the entire natural world. So given that these venoms are so complex, 
have so many molecules in there. The obvious question is, can any of them be a benefit in terms of treating human disease? And the unequivocal answer is yes. We already have six drugs that have been derived from venoms, and I'm going to give you examples of two of them. And the first one is the very first ever venom-derived drug, and it comes from a deadly snake. It comes from a Brazilian viper called Bothrops gerarica. And what clinicians noticed is when people came into the hospital that had been envenomated by the spider, that they were suffering from a precipitous drop in blood pressure. And some smart people at Squibb Pharmaceuticals said, what if we could work out what the molecule was that caused that decrease in blood pressure? Maybe that would be useful for people with high blood pressure. And they did isolate that molecule. It was a small peptide. They made a few changes, and it became the world's first blockbuster antihypertensive drug. And all modern antihypertensive drugs are derived from that molecule from that snake. So that snake has certainly killed some people, but the drug that we've got out of its venom has saved many more lives than that. The second example is a more recent one I like to give, just because I think this is a beautiful lizard. It's an anti-diabetic drug derived from the venom of the beautiful Gila monster lizard. This is a small peptide. It's a very successful anti-diabetic drug. And the point I want to make with this one is that human chemists tried to take this peptide and make changes and make it better and tried a whole bunch of things. But the drug that they ended up with was exactly the same molecule that's in the venom of the lizard. They couldn't beat the evolution that had gone on in creating that venom. So the xenotide, the drug bieta, is the exact same molecule that you would find in the venom of this lizard. So I want to talk a little bit now about the sort of work that's going on here at the University of Queensland, specifically in my lab in this area. We use venoms to inspire the development of drugs to treat nervous system disorders. And the particular disorder I want to talk about today is stroke. I, I think we've all been touched by somebody in our family or circle of friends who has suffered a stroke. It is, after all, the second largest killer of people in the world. It's the third largest cause killer in Australia. It's actually also the primary cause of long-term disability. And the reason for that, as I'm sure you all know, is that stroke causes brain damage. So one year after a stroke, 50% of survivors still require daily care because of the disability they've suffered as a result of the stroke. And the problem is we have no therapeutic options for these people. We have no drugs to prevent the brain damage after stroke, not a single one. So there are two types of stroke. There is a hemorrhagic stroke, which is a bleed in the brain. And for that, there's no drugs at all that we can use. You're at the mercy of what happens to your brain. The other type of stroke is an ischemic stroke where there's a clot in an artery leading to the brain. And for that, we have one drug called TPA. It's a clot-busting drug, an attempt to remove that clot. The problem is it can't be used in hemorrhagic stroke. It would make the situation worse. And even in ischemic stroke, it could induce potentially an intracranial hemorrhage, so neurologists are scared of it. They don't like to use it, and the reality is that only 5% of all stroke patients worldwide get this drug. So most stroke patients get no drugs at all. It's quite remarkable. So what happens in a stroke? What is, what is it that we're trying to, to, to sort of um, develop a drug to prevent? So there's a clot in an artery, and what that does is lead to a lack of, of blood supply to that region of the brain and lack of oxygen. The core region that's affected, the so-called ischemic core, the dogma, what is taught to medical students, is that that part of the brain will die pretty much instantaneously and you're never going to recover that. It's not therapeutically recoverable, forget about the ischemic core. But there's a spreading wave of destruction out from that ischemic core that evolves over hours to days, so a slow evolution. And the thought is if you had a good drug, you might be able to minimise this so-called peri-infarct zone. And so that's what we've been trying to do. So what happens biochemically in a stroke? So you've got decreased blood supply to the brain, a lack of oxygen, and because of that, the brain has to change the way it utilises its fuel. And some of you probably know that the brain is the biggest user of glucose in your body. It consumes huge amounts of glucose because nerve cells are really energy hungry but it can't burn the glucose the way it would like to. It has to revert instead to an ancient metabolic pathway called glycolysis. And the end product of glycolysis is something called lactic acid. It's the same thing that happens in your muscles when you're working really hard, say you're running, your muscles can't get oxygen hard enough, they also use this pathway, you end up with lactic acid, that's what causes the pain in your muscle, but of course your muscle can clear it. 
Your brain in a stroke can't clear that lactic acid. So your brain actually becomes acidic. The pH of your brain goes down. So you get what's called brain acidosis. And unfortunately, at the end of your neurons, those little red dots I've drawn at the end of the neuron there, there's an ion channel called acid sensing ion channel 1A, a horrible name, or just ASIC 1A. So ion channels are things that sit in the membranes of your neurons and they let ions in and out, sodium, potassium, calcium. This one sits at the end of your nerves and it detects changes in pH. So when your brain becomes acidic after the stroke, it activates that channel. That channel turns on and unfortunately what that channel then does is send a signal to that neuron that says die. And so the neuron dies as a result of the activation of that channel. So we had a very simple idea based on the work of ours and others and that is what if we could find a molecule that stopped that channel being activated in the context of stroke? Could we prevent the brain damage downstream of that activation? Of course, what we needed, though, was a really potent inhibitor of that channel, something that inhibited that channel really well. And we turned to venoms. Why venoms? We work with neurotoxic venoms that target the nervous system of their prey. And they're full of molecules, therefore, that target these ion channels. They're the best known natural source of these ion channel modulators. Now, at the University of Queensland, we had the largest collection of venoms in the world. Venom from over 700 species of all types of venomous animals from all around the world. So the winning molecule in this context could have come from anywhere. But I'm delighted to say the winning molecule came from a local spider. The winning molecule came from the Fraser Island funnel web spider. Those of you watching from overseas, Fraser Island is the biggest sand island in the world found a couple of hours to the north of Brisbane and has a population of these funnel web spiders. And the molecule we found in that spider, I've shown the three-dimensional structure here being animated, we call HI1A. It's about one and a half times the size of human insulin. Now, when we started this project, we knew there was one small molecule that inhibited that channel. It was an anti-diuretic drug called amylaride. And this peptide that we isolated from the Fraser Island funnel web spider inhibits the channel with 20,000-fold higher potency than that small molecule drug. It's an extraordinarily potent selective inhibitor of that ASIG1A channel. And so we had the molecule we needed to test our hypothesis. Does this molecule prevent damage after stroke? And so the experiment I've shown you here is where rats after a stroke are either not treated or they're given this molecule two hours after the stroke. And what those bars are showing you there is the infarct size or the amount of brain that's died effectively. And if you compare the red bar, the animals that didn't get the HI1A peptide from the spider, and the green ones that did, you can see we've reduced the brain damage by over 80%. This is remarkable. So then we tried, we said, what happens if we deliver the drug four hours after stroke? That's an important number because that's the longest time at which the current drug can be delivered. And 60% of people take more than two hours to get to the hospital. And you can see even when we give the drug four hours after the stroke begins, we still can reduce the brain damage by almost 90%. So then we went into completely uncharted territory. Eight hours, which is twice the longest time at which you can give the current drug that's available, the only one. And even at eight hours, we still were able to reduce the brain damage by 65%. Now, this data is the peri-infarct zone, the zone that I told you at the beginning should be therapeutically recoverable, and I think this should prove that it is recoverable. But what about the ischemic core? Remember, the dogma is ischemic core is going to die straight away. You're not going to recover it. This is what happens in the ischemic core. We still see a reduction in brain damage in the ischemic core. So we believe the dogma is wrong. We believe that if you have a good drug, you can actually protect that part of the brain as well, which is really exciting. The other thing we wanted to look at is it's, it's, what we want to do is have a drug that will both enable more people to survive a stroke, but give them better quality of life afterwards. We went and looked at the neurological performance of the mice and their motor performance, that is their muscular activity. Now this neurological score um, is a composite score of watching them to do various activities. And a score of zero means these are perfectly happy, happy rats that do normal things. And a score of six means they're essentially paralysed and incapable of doing virtually anything. And you can see 72 hours after the stroke, these rats are severely impaired. So this is what happens to the rats, though, that got the drug. 
two hours after the stroke, almost back to normal. Their neurological function is retained despite the fact that they've suffered a stroke. So then we looked at their motor coordination and to do that, we get them to walk down a little narrow beam into their nest and rodents are really good at balancing and climbing. So you can see before the stroke, they never get that wrong. They, they will never fall off the beam. But 72 hours after the stroke, the untreated rats are falling off almost every time. They've completely lost their motor coordination. And this is what happens to the rats that got the drug two hours after the stroke. You can see again, we've almost um, normalized their motor coordination. These are very happy, well-coordinated rats, which is very exciting. So why do we think this potentially could be a very important breakthrough in the stroke field? Well, the first thing is, this is not a clot-busting drug. There's no risk of it inducing bleeding, and therefore it should be okay to be given to hemorrhagic stroke patients. Why is that important? Because at the moment, you can't treat a stroke patient until you get to the hospital and image their brain. Because you must know whether it's a hemorrhagic or an ischemic stroke. Because if it's a hemorrhagic stroke, you can't do anything. You can only give the drug if it's ischemic. But this drug you can give to any stroke patient. And the important thing about that is it means that first responders might be able to deliver it. And why is that important? Because once the stroke starts, you lose 2 million neurons per minute. So the sooner you can get a drug in there that protects the brain, the better the outcome is going to be for that patient. The other thing that's important is we've shown there's a very long treatment window. Remember I told you we even got an effect eight hours after stroke. This is very important for areas like Queensland that are huge and, and not very densely populated. So if you're in a regional area or perhaps you're in the Torres Strait region of, of, of Australia and you've got to get to a hospital in the mainland, that can take five or six hours. And what we've shown is even if it does take that long, then you're going to get some benefit from this drug. So it's going to be really important for people in regional areas. And the really interesting new discovery we made just recently is we asked the question, well, since this uh, channel is really important in ischemic injury of the brain, is it important for ischemic injury of other organs, that is, in injuries due to lack of oxygen? And the, the, the organ that's most susceptible to that, aside from the brain, is the heart, and we found that the molecule also protects the heart muscle cells from ischemic injury. So it may have applications in heart attack, cardiac arrest, and in fact maintaining the integrity of donor hearts that are going to be transplanted as well. So I want to end with the final fun fact of the day, which I hope by now you're all going to agree with, and that is that venomous animals are awesome, <laughs> right? Um, they, for the most part, pose no threat to humans. But even those that do can provide life-saving drugs, and we saw that with that venomous viper, that Bothrops gerarica, that, that, that led to that antihypertensive drug. So as I said at the beginning, rather than vilifying venomous animals, I think we should learn to admire them, and as this gentleman shows us, respect them as well. <laughs>